The Berlin-based aid organization Kadus treats people who've been injured or wounded in the war with so-called Islamic State. They haven't seen a doctor in three years, imagine that. And now they urgently need some kind of medical care. They work where others fear to tread, right behind the front lines, in villages that have just been liberated from IS. Erbil is the capital of the autonomous region of Kurdistan in northern Iraq. The local headquarters of Qadus is in the district of Ankawa, where a rented house serves as both office and accommodation. Final preparations for a mission are underway. I know what can go wrong. I know what can happen to the team, which is one of the reasons why we have to work so closely with the military. Fear is the wrong expression. It's more like treating the violence with respect, in a negative sense. It's immense violence. Faye Bauman is responsible for the mission in Iraq. The former event manager has been in northern Iraq for months. She coordinates Qadus' work in the war zone. When you're ready, we ought to sit down together, get organized, and start loading up. Matthias Heisig is a surgeon in Berlin. He's taken two weeks leave for this mission. The team aims to set up right behind the front line in a couple of days. I'm packing all the diagnostic equipment into a single box so that everything's in the same place. It includes devices for measuring blood glucose and blood pressure, looking inside the ears and an ultrasound device. Kadus is international. The current crew is made up of two doctors, a paramedic and a nurse. Canadian Heather Dow has often worked in crisis zones. I wanted to come and work in Iraq because I have been working so far um, once a year going to Haiti and doing medical clinics there. And uh, a few years ago, there was a big typhoon in the Philippines, and I went as a relief worker with a nurse friend of mine. And I'm the only gray hair here, but everybody else is very young, 20s, I guess. But I'm the grandmother, and I'm here to help as much as I can. Kadus was founded less than three years ago. Crews of volunteers change regularly. They need a range of permits to operate in the war zone. Office manager Priya Pavri takes care of that side of things. I guess the risk is always that things change so quickly. So today or tomorrow morning when we leave, it could, they could say to us, the perimeter is fine, it's safe, um, go ahead. But by the time um, we get there, something might have changed, they might have retreated, the front line might have moved. Um, so I think the uncertainty of the situation is always the biggest danger, but we do our best to try and sort of be informed and be mobile and be organized um, so that we can move back and forth as the situation changes. The missions are agreed in coordination with the World Health Organization. Faye Bauman also has to coordinate with the Iraqi army for security reasons. The destination for Kadus this time is the region of Hawija outside the Kurdish autonomous region. Kadus specializes in treating seriously wounded victims of war. To get to the war zone, the crew needs passes and special permits for both the Kurdish and the Iraqi territories. We'll definitely have to pass a lot of checkpoints. We have permits for all of them, they're all on our list. But the problem is, things can change overnight. There's always some issue, and that can cause us delays. Filming is strictly prohibited at the checkpoints. 
The convoy leaves Erbil, heading toward Mosul. From there, it heads south toward Hawija. At the time of filming, most of the area around the city was held by the IS. Twelve hours later, in the early evening, the crew reaches the war zone. The Iraqi army only reconquered the villages in the area just a few days previously. The Kadu's crew is put up in a house requisitioned by the army. The Iraqi Army Medical Corps has already set up a makeshift field hospital next door. It's equipped with the bare minimum to treat the wounded. This is where the Kadus crew will work. This surgery has five beds. We basically use it to stabilize patients enough for them to make the journey to the nearest hospital. The area was the scene of fierce fighting just a few days earlier. IS fighters had taken up positions on the roof of the building. Now, Iraqi army vehicles are advancing. A special U.S. Army unit is also operating within sight of the Katus team. Officially, they are there in an advisory capacity, but their armored vehicles suggest otherwise. Exactly how many U.S. soldiers are involved in the fight against IS is kept secret. The responsible medical officer from the Iraqi army is Major Mohammed Hassan. He decides where Qadus can and can't go. The 9th Division armored now finish all the missions, arrive to the Azab River, okay, uh, finish, uh, finish the, the, the battle in here. Until now, I think uh, take a new axis. But until now, uh, no have any information on a new mission, a new mission. I think in the few next days, uh, beginning a new mission, but I, I don't know any information on this mission. The offensive made faster progress than expected, but without major casualties. Already, attention is turning to how to help the civilian population in the liberated villages. Kadus is based in Berlin. It was founded by Sebastian Junemann, a qualified psychologist and paramedic. In a workshop beneath a rail track, boxes are welded, spare parts prepared, and vehicles refitted. Some of the staff have known each other for years. They used to organize music festivals. Now, they want to save lives. Unimann is no stranger to international aid work. I never really liked the way the missions were set up or the working atmosphere in the aid organizations. I'd spent more than 10 years organizing festivals with people who were enthusiastic and fun to work with. And then one day we had the idea of trying to translate this excellent cooperation into an aid context. Because Kadus doesn't get any government funding, all its staff are volunteers. They want to save people from war and injustice in the world. I think it's important to help these people, so I'm happy to spend my time here. I do PR work because I have no medical or technical training, so I do what I can to make my contribution. I found my way in via a voluntary internship, and I can identify with the values of Kados. They're humane values. Things we should be able to take for granted, that everybody can live in freedom and equality. Uniman seldom personally takes part in the missions. He has to raise money. Otherwise, Kados could not exist. This is for a full-time job. For some of us, it's a full-time job with no regular pay. The motivation comes from somewhere else. I wish the projects were paid for by third parties so that we would not have to rely 100% on donations, because it's a daily struggle that really takes it out of you. And of course, I hope it continues to work, that nobody gets hurt and that we can carry out more projects.
Twice a week, Uniman works as a bouncer in a popular Berlin nightclub. It's the only way he can earn a regular wage and keep his national health insurance. Of course, when you found an organization like this, you don't have enough money at the start. So you have to choose between spending donations on yourself or putting them into projects and finding other sources of income. I can earn money at night here. And when I say I have to go away for a month to take part in a mission, they accommodate that. I'm grateful. Uniman lives his life between the nightclub and the war zone. It's day three after the volunteers' arrival in Hawija. It's time to get to work. Surgeon Matthias Heisig is up at the crack of dawn, getting ready for the crew's mission in a village that was liberated just a couple of days ago. Today we're going to a little village where the people probably haven't seen a doctor in three years. Until very recently it was all IS territory that's now been liberated. We'll see how the civilian population is doing and try to help where we can. Normally our focus is on trauma patients, but in this case there are no trauma patients. What the people need is primary medical care. The convoy, now including three Iraqi army ambulances, heads south making a big detour to steer clear of territory still held by IS. Dr. Heather Dow is expecting to encounter a range of everyday illnesses. We'll probably see some dehydration, uh, children and adults, um, and then we'll see chronic medical conditions, maybe some wounds. Uh, I'm going to do a small minor surgery procedure on a patient, female patient. So we've brought all, pretty much all the medications that we have for primary care as well as our emergency packs for if we have to treat any wounded from the front line. When the war broke out, many doctors fled. There's simply no medicine left here. Now it's up to Katus to help, although that's not what it was set up for, according to the volunteers. We can't offer long-term care here. That's for the Iraqi state to do. What we can do here is just a drop in the ocean. We're not in a position to organize anything long-term. The streets are badly damaged from the fighting. One of the Iraqi ambulances runs into trouble. One of its bumpers has come loose. Stopping is always risky. There are improvised explosive devices almost everywhere. On the way into the village, the volunteers encounter huge convoys of fighters, including the notorious Shia militias, who are accused of committing war crimes. It's best to avoid them, but the volunteers are not scared. Call me mad, and I'm sure some people do, but I still feel quite safe. We haven't had to put on our flak jackets, and there haven't been any critical situations yet. Everything's been calm so far. It takes the convoy around two hours to cover 70 kilometers. Finally, it arrives in the village of Asharia. The army has selected what it deems a safe house. We always have to be on the lookout for booby traps everywhere we go. But as long as we stick to the roads we know have been used by others before us, it should be okay. The Kadu's team has to hit the ground running because it's not clear how long the army will stay here. The crew turns a former living room into a surgery. This is our pharmacy, so what um, uh, Matthias is doing is organizing things by class of medication so that we can access it quickly. 
and hopefully be able to get to the medications from each of these examining beds. Within minutes of the crew's arrival, people start coming in droves. One man brings his injured son, saying he fell from a tree. There is no telling how true that is. He fell from the date bomb. He fell? Yeah, fell from the date bomb. The boy is suffering from pain in his legs and back. The doctor's instructions are translated by Tiger, a Kurd from the Erbil area. Matthias Heisek examines the boy, but without an X-ray machine, can't make a diagnosis. His main complaint of pain seems to be in his thoracic spine here. It's possible because he landed on his feet that he may have a compression fracture of his uh, vertebra at that level. But there's nothing one can do about that, even in the first world. The doctors also suspect concussion. All they can give them is painkillers and medical advice. Uh, Tiger, can you explain that with head injury, it takes a while for the brain to get better? Uh, it can make him feel dizzy. Trouble, trouble seeing well. Headaches. And trouble with memory. As the day progresses, more and more people arrive. This old woman can't walk. Another collapses right in front of the doctors. An elderly man complains of heart problems. It's hard to make a diagnosis. He says he has problems with his heart, especially when stressed. That suggests a cardiac insufficiency, which is hard to treat long term in this situation. It could be stress, but it's probably a chronic illness. It's hard to establish that in a brief conversation. This young man has an infected abscess behind his ear, known as an atheroma. He needs to have it lanced, otherwise he could get blood poisoning. He had an infected atheroma behind his ear that we had to open up. In principle, that's something we can do here, and it wouldn't require an operating theater in Germany either. We just need local sterilization. But we can't tell how well the wound will be treated afterwards. Normally, we would remove the capsule. We didn't do it in this case because it would have caused heavy bleeding. There is also the risk that it will come back. <laughs> This 14-year-old boy can hardly walk. His knees are deformed. There's little the doctors here can do. He really needs to see a rheumatologist, uh, especially at that age, to have that advancement of the disease is very worrying because he will be very disabled in his life, especially if he does a laboring job. He won't be able to make a living. After five hours, lines of patients still aren't getting any shorter. The doctors and medics work without a break until they're at their limits. Of course we work as fast as possible because there's a long line and we don't have that much time. It's like a conveyor belt, but we do try to take time for every patient. The Kato's mission in Iraq began in Mosul, where Uniman and his staff set up a mobile first aid center right behind the front lines on behalf of the World Health Organization. They turned a former car garage into an emergency room. While the Iraqi army advanced on IS positions in the old town, civilians arrived around the clock. Many of them had shrapnel or gunshot wounds. Sebastian Uniman spent several weeks here with his team, trying to treat the many casualties. In international jargon, an emergency room like this is known as a TSP. A TSP is a trauma stabilization point. That means it's not a hospital where we can perform surgery. We're right behind the front line and we keep following it. We're the first port of call for wounded civilians or combatants, regardless of what side they belong to. We're there to save lives. We want to stabilize the patients so that they can be transported to a proper hospital. 
The surgeon Stefan Jarosz is looking after an injured boy. We don't know where they're from. It's often like that here. The civilians are brought in from somewhere in any old vehicle rather than an ambulance. A quick look at this guy tells me that he's reasonably stable and his life is not in acute danger. The boy, his upper body covered with inadequately treated burns, arrived with another injured boy. Two days ago. A mortar round landed near him a couple of days ago, and he sustained these wounds. Okay. We'll take off the bandages. Okay. Fifteen-year-old Abbas was at home when the shells hit. The doctors want to know where his parents are. Stefan, yours is also alone? Okay, and then they were separated from their families? Did you visit your parents? Did you visit them? No. Do you They are dead. Okay. The second boy has a bullet wound in the face, but he's alive. Right side, exit on the left. I think it's uh, in and oh, out. Okay. The doctors don't know if the boys have any family left. They are unaccompanied. Their parents are dead, according to the boy. For us, that means we don't just treat their wounds. We have to inform the UN that we have unaccompanied minors here, because the UN has a special protocol for this situation. The boys will probably end up in a UN refugee camp for the time being. Kadus set up a TSP in the old town of Mosul, where the Iraqi army met resistance from the remaining pockets of IS fighters. Many of the civilians brought here had been used as human shields. Anyone who tried to escape was shot. Yesterday we had two people who'd been shot trying to escape, and their wounds were so bad that they died. But most of the civilians are just at the limits of their human endurance. They've been besieged for months. Some of them are the families of IS fighters, wives, children, who haven't had anything proper to eat for weeks. They're dehydrated. It's 45 degrees in the shade here during the day. They're wearing hijabs. They're dressed in black in that heat. And they're totally dehydrated, and they have circulation problems. Kados has been working in Mosul for nearly two months, to good effect they've saved many lives. There's no emergency service here with trained paramedics. That means there's no proper treatment available until someone reaches a hospital. And many of them have been bombed here in the city, so it can take a long time to get to a hospital. So there's no doubt, without the four TSPs here, us and three other organizations, hundreds more would have died. The guns have been silent in Mosul for months now, but 90% of the city is in ruins. The WHO's latest mission for Kadus is behind the front line of Hawija. In contrast to Mosul, there are no badly wounded people in the rural region of Hawija. So Kadus turned its attention to the villagers who receive little or no care otherwise. The crew has a few toys for the children who are brought here. These children haven't seen a doctor for more than three years. Time and again, they had to flee the fighting with their parents. Many have been traumatized by the ongoing violence and constant fear. <laughs> To be honest, I have the impression that the children are confused, understandably. I think it will take a while for them to realize what's going on. That child just now, for example, probably didn't really know what to do with the toys. That's perfectly normal in the circumstances. At least the parents were happy. <laughs> For security reasons, there are always soldiers in the surgery, too. The hygiene in the village is problematic. 
This man has a skin rash and is itchy all over. Uh, does he have soap to wash? Soap to wash? What do you mean? Because they all have this itching. I give him a painkiller when he has pain. Itching. So the itching is because of the water. Can you give him any antihistamine? Yeah, he gets something, but he he needs soap and good, good water. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. But I can't do anything against him. Yeah, he needs good water. Suddenly, a young man is brought in needing urgent help. Okay. He has a gaping head wound and has already lost a lot of blood. Allegedly, he jumped in a river. We're not told why. He won't say anything himself. Can I just use one syringe and then give it back to you? I'll rinse it out. The circumstances of the young man's injuries remain unclear. What we do know is that he was brought in by Iraqi soldiers. It would not be the first time that Iraqi troops have maltreated a civilian. When I found any team from Qaeda or from Iraqi army in here, maybe this day, because it's still stay bleeding more time, maybe effect on him, maybe day. Nobody knows who will take over when Qadus leaves. The troops are being withdrawn and the crew has to go with them or they'd have no protection. We're leaving in five minutes. After that, the army will be gone. The volunteers worked for almost six hours here without a break. There's no telling how many patients they treated altogether. I've lost track. We worked solidly. I have no idea how many patients we treated. Could have easily been a hundred. We worked for hours with no break, barely any food or water, lots of patients. The volunteers came expecting to treat trauma patients, but the people treated today really need long-term medical care. There's no hope of that without a local doctor. As you saw in the case of the head trauma, it's exciting, right? Yep, blood and blood and cuts and things like that are exciting. And it is a trauma service, Caddis is trauma service. So this was difficult, I think, for the, the guys that were here today because they came expecting to do trauma work and it's primary care that we've been doing. It's not very sexy. It is very necessary for the general health of the population. So um, I, I don't blame them, they're all young. They all gravitated to, you know, the sexy thing. But the thing is, we're here to see the rest of the people. We have to, we have to see them all. No one's going to come. Thank you so much. This mission is scheduled to continue for about two weeks. Then the WHO will decide where Kadus goes next. But there's no shortage of places that need them. I'm here to help as much as I can. Kadus was founded less than three years ago. Crews of volunteers change regularly. They need a range of permits to operate in the war zone. Office manager Priya Pavri takes care of that side of things. I guess the risk is always that things change so quickly. So today or tomorrow morning when we leave, it could, they could say to us, the perimeter is fine, it's safe, um, go ahead. But by the time um, we get there, something might have changed, they might have retreated, the front line might have moved. Um, so I think the uncertainty of the situation is always the biggest danger, but we do our best to try and sort of be informed and be mobile and be organized um, so that we can move back and forth as the situation changes. The missions are agreed in coordination with the World Health Organization. Faye Bauman also has to coordinate with the Iraqi army for security reasons. Final preparations for a mission are underway. I know what can go wrong. I know what can happen to the team, which is one of the reasons why we have to work so closely with the military. Fear is the wrong expression. It's more like treating the violence with respect. 
in a negative sense. It's immense violence. Gewalt. Dieser immensen Gewalt. Faye Bauman is responsible for the mission in Iraq. The former event manager has been in northern Iraq for months. She coordinates Qatar's work in the war zone. When you're ready, we ought to sit down together, get organized, and start loading up. Matthias Heisig is a surgeon in Berlin. He's taken two weeks' leave for this mission. The team aims to set up right behind the front line in a couple of days. The Berlin-based aid organization Kadus treats people who've been injured or wounded in the war with so-called Islamic State. They haven't seen a doctor in three years, imagine that. And now they urgently need some kind of medical care. They work where others fear to tread, right behind the front lines, in villages that have just been liberated from IS. Erbil is the capital of the autonomous region of Kurdistan in northern Iraq. The local headquarters of Qadus is in the district of Ankawa, where a rented house serves as both office and accommodation. The destination for Qadus this time is the region of Hawija, outside the Kurdish autonomous region. Kadus specializes in treating seriously wounded victims of war. To get to the war zone, the crew needs passes and special permits for both the Kurdish and the Iraqi territories. We'll definitely have to pass a lot of checkpoints. We have permits for all of them, they're all on our list. But the problem is, things can change overnight. There's always some issue, and that can cause us delays. Filming is strictly prohibited at the checkpoints. The convoy leaves Erbil, heading toward Mosul. I'm packing all the diagnostic equipment into a single box so that everything's in the same place. It includes devices for measuring blood glucose and blood pressure, looking inside the ears and an ultrasound device. Kadus is international. The current crew is made up of two doctors, a paramedic and a nurse. Canadian Heather Dow has often worked in crisis zones. I wanted to come and work in Iraq because I have been working so far um, once a year going to Haiti and doing medical clinics there. And uh, a few years ago, there was a big typhoon in the Philippines, and I went as a relief worker with a nurse friend of mine. And I'm the only gray hair here, but everybody else is very young, 20s, I guess. But I'm the grandmother, and... Uh,